We're going to talk about China's economy in 2023, give an outlook on 2024, discuss their real estate crisis, as well as touch upon their current languishing stock market. As an investment theme, China is heavily debated among institutional investors. I know there will be a lot of opinions on this, but I will do my best here to provide objective macro data and facts. I'll also provide some education to help folks understand what data points are actually important to follow. Now, most people may be focused on practical topics like whether China is still investable and the implications of the currently challenged US and China relationship. And we'll attempt to answer this question. We'll also touch on hot retail investor topics such as Alibaba, the Hang Seng, and China stocks in general towards the end. So make sure to hang around. Now, this will be an interesting discussion, so make sure to join me here by subscribing, turning on the bell, and joining me on Substack, Instagram, and Twitter for more frequent updates. I comment on China quite frequently on my other platforms. Let's start with the big picture so that everyone understands how China's economy works. As of now, industrial production and manufacturing exports continue to be the key drivers of China's economy. Manufacturing is a very large part of China's GDP and contributes about 28%. We can see here that industrial output is nearly 40% of the economy and GDP. And the rest of the economy is comprised of other key industries such as property, technology, healthcare, and finance. This is precisely why some of the most important macro data points that large money managers tend to follow include the Purchasing Manufacturing Index, short for PMIs, as well as industrial output. Together with retail sales, which measures consumer spending and property housing values, this will give us a sense of the wealth effect given real estate's large importance in household wealth. These four metrics, PMIs, industrial output, retail sales, and property values, are considered to capture the big picture of China's health month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. So let's take a look at these four metrics in charts to understand where China's economy has been in the past year and where the data suggests that it may be going. On PMIs, which tell us about the health of the manufacturing sector, we can see that after an early 2023 boom recovery, most likely attributed to the reopening phase for China, we essentially saw PMIs fall significantly after the spring, only to see the important 50 level again recently, which represents the expansion and contraction cutoff level when interpreting the PMIs. 50, a very important metric. PMIs are absolutely critical for interpreting the domestic demand for consumer goods as well as demand for China's products as exports. Now on industrial output, year-over-year -year figures only started to normalize to historical averages earlier this summer, but that's coming off a very low base in 2022. Now this is a good start, but with a lower base, it is easier to achieve growth figures year-over-year. So as we head into next year, now that we have a higher base to work with, if we can keep these figures stable, then very likely this signals that there is a long-term path to recovery in this part of the economy as industrial output stabilizes. Now for retail sales, we're seeing consumers spend very conservatively in the past several months. These figures are also year over year. So low single digit growth actually means after adjusting for inflation, not much growth happened after all. Retail sales will be highly correlated with initiatives to bring down youth unemployment as well as any policy on property stimulus. And finally, on property prices, which I'll talk about more later, we can see that it's been a very mixed picture with the mega tier one cities being more cushioned from the housing market correction, while tier three cities in China have taken a far larger hit. Property is a major source of household wealth in China and stabilizing prices is absolutely essential for any recovery to be structural rather than cyclical. When we think about China as a country, we sometimes think about the biggest cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen representing the GDP drivers. But the truth is that most of China's GDP, about 60% of it, comes from tier three cities. And 50% of the value of the housing stock also comes from tier three cities. Now in financial media, we have heard a lot about China's real estate being a big problem. The structural problem being a lot of oversupply, which has led to a phenomenon of ghost cities. And I've got a lot more information on this in just a minute, but first I wanted to introduce and thank our video partner today, Policy Genius.
Now, let's take a moment to talk about our video partner today, Policy Genius. We're entering the holiday season and we have the opportunity to spend some time with family and they are a great reminder of our responsibility to protect them by planning to secure their future. Security through life insurance is a powerful way to give all of your family members peace of mind because it gives a safety net which would provide for your family. Let's say that you have life insurance policies through work. It may not follow you if you leave your job. I know that when I became a full-time small business owner five years ago, my life insurance policies from my previous company did not follow me afterwards. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their licensed experts is here to help you talk through it. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is and their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage and some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you and not the insurance companies. That means means that they don't have any incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance because it's objective. Being able to recommend insurers with integrity with great service is why they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your family deserves peace of mind and a life insurance policy through Policy Genius can give it to them. See my link below to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save on their helpful marketplace. To understand this area better, during my vacation to China earlier this fall, I also treated it as a research opportunity to understand the landscape better by being on the ground. I wanted to see what kind of new trends I could observe locally. I visited three major tier one cities, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Shanghai, and one tier three city called Guizhou. In China, real estate prices are typically measured by price per square meter. Here in the US, we tend to look at the overall home value, say that the house is $500,000. In China, we think of property in terms of that apartment or flat or condo being priced at say 50,000 yuan per square meter. Now based on my observations and looking at the housing statistics, the tier one cities in China saw a correction in home values in the 10, 15% region, whereas the tier three cities and beyond most likely saw a housing slump that was far deeper, probably in the 30% plus region. Now in the years leading up to 2023, there was a substantial buildup of real estate stock in many tier three cities. In a Stanford research study from late 2022, researchers Mr. Rugoff and Mr. Yang both came to the conclusion that the heart of the real estate problems in China lie in the tier three cities. And based on what I witnessed firsthand in tier one cities and my smaller sample size of tier three cities, I definitely agree with this. Because despite a correction in home prices in tier one China cities, the housing prices are measured by price to income ratios and they are still one of the most expensive in the world. Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou actually have a price income ratios at more than 30 times, which makes New York look affordable. So if I want to be more objective about looking at the situation, despite all this discussion about a property crash in China, the prices in tier one cities are so high that it is unaffordable to the majority of first time homeowners even after this correction. On the flip side, what this means is that if you're not a first time home buyer and you already own property in tier one cities, this latest correction in home values hasn't really made an impact on your consumption lifestyle since prices are still astronomically high and most baby boomers in China have paid off their mortgages. To put it in perspective, I would estimate that a 400 to 500 square foot condo in tier one cities in a good neighborhood would cost at least $1 million. And with families sitting on such massive positive real estate equity, the youth college graduate unemployment figures of 25% is alarming, but not socially chaotic because young people have a safety net to rely on, their parents. Now, is this sustainable? I don't think so, and it's definitely a problem. But in my opinion, the reason that we haven't seen significant societal uprising is because of this demographic dynamic where there are a lot of wealthy baby boomers in China. Now, if we had 25% college graduate unemployment here in the US and Canada, and have them be on the hook for student loans accruing at 7% interest, then yes, we would see large scale protests probably almost every month. On the other hand, I did witness a tremendous amount of housing supply once we entered China's tier three city regions. 
The situation in tier three cities is much more uncertain than in tier one. And this overbuilding and the property developers financing approach to build homes which would not meet the expected demand put the writing on the wall that several property developers that focused on these smaller tier three cities with aggressive housing development were going to face harsh outcomes because of the supply and demand dynamic. Country Gardens distress is the latest victim of a slowing real estate market, though there could be some eventual relief in the industry as a whole, with Evergrande being given until January 2024 to reach a restructuring deal. Now, with real estate being such a large driver of Chinese household wealth, any top-down policy to give assurance that the real estate market will eventually stabilize is going to be very helpful for the local economy to rebound. Specifically, more of the policy should be generated at Tier 3 cities for sentiment to rebound across the board. Tier 1 will recover eventually, regardless of whether the government steps in for additional support, in my opinion. So that's just a brief overview of the domestic situation in China. Outside of China, geopolitics look more and more like tricky landmines. We just observed that Biden and Xi had their first in-person meeting in over two years. And while I was optimistic heading into this event that the rhetoric would improve, the entire meeting saw further deterioration by a last-minute question from a reporter to Joe Biden. And we know how Biden responded there. And I'm not going to comment on that. Over in the EU, we're seeing Italy pull out of the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as many European nations scrutinizing China EV subsidies to ensure that European domestic brands are able to compete well. And this has led Xi Jinping to meet with the EU bloc to further boost confidence that China and Europe can work jointly together to each other's benefit. Now, if the EU gets hawkish on China, this will temporarily provide roadblocks to EV stars like BYD, Li Auto, and Xiaoping. But long term, I was very impressed with the type of EV cars that I saw in China. Tesla is certainly very popular on the mainland, but the other EV rivals are very prevalent on the road as well. Now, as for retail favorite Alibaba, the former leader in the Hang Seng, We've seen their fundamental market share of online e-commerce fall to about 40%, while Pinduoduo now commands 19% of the market in China, as Timu is a large hit with consumers. Pinduoduo has been exceptionally successful in expanding overseas into North America, whereas Alibaba's international strategy of AliExpress doesn't have the same use case among consumers. And now that Alibaba has decided to issue a dividend, we essentially saw the company indirectly admit that the firm is no longer a growth story, but it's transitioning towards being a dividend stock. This challenges the value of Alibaba being a long-term growth company. Now, as for whether the Hang Seng is still investable, my answer is that it's tradable at certain key levels for a defined return target. There are definitely good companies inside China ADRs and the Hang Seng, but their volatility means that holding periods will have to be flexible and expectations will have to be managed. We were able to find some great opportunities for Pinduoduo and New Oriental on investing timelines and BYD as tactical ideas. This has helped our overall strategy fare decently considering that a big part of my strategy is related to China. Overall though, I continue to think that China stocks are going to be challenging for the foreseeable future, but here and there, there will be spots to look for scalps. It has not been an easy year for China to say the least, but with valuations now very low, earnings per share estimates now lowered, and technical structures being de-risked as of this video, one can make the case that today's Hang Seng at 16,000 and change is more de-risked than it was when it was at 23,000 earlier this year in January. Now, for the rest of the institutional and retail community, I'm sure that they are looking for more progress on property, stimulus, and geopolitical easing before reallocating their capital. And I'll have more commentary on this topic in my platform, so make sure to follow me here, Substack, Instagram, and Twitter for more. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you to Policy Genius for sponsoring today's video.